Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Resurrection Sunday, April 17th, 2022. We are in Lesson 7, still in Unit 2, from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, which is entitled Liberating Gospels. Unit 2 is entitled Liberating Gospels. The lesson title is the eternal hope and i hope and uh, pray that uh, we are all rejoicing in our salvation that was bought by the death and the resurrection and we are justified by the resurrection of our lord jesus christ and i hope that we are truly celebrating and rejoicing this day of uh, our devotional reading it's taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 11 to 18. Our background scripture is from Matthew, chapter 27, and chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. Printed or lesson passage is also Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. Our lesson aims from the quarterly or number one understand Matthew's account of the resurrection number two embrace the possibilities of liberation found in Jesus's resurrection and number two live courageously in the freedom that Jesus gives and that is the freedom from sin from the bondage to sin and uh, our key verse is verse 10 matthew chapter 28 verse 10 which is then said jesus unto them be not afraid go tell my brethren that they go into galilee and that there they shall see me after the introduction our lesson has three major divisions uh, the first is entitled the arrival that's covered between Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 to 3. The second is the announcement. It's covered between chapter 28 verses 4 and 7, 4 to 7. And the third is the action. And that's covered between verses 10, uh, 8 and 10, 8 and 10. From the standard commentary, uh, our lesson title is resurrection of the king resurrection of the king and very briefly additional aims from the standard or number one lists facts of jesus's first post-resurrection appearance in matthew's account number two compare and contrast the account with those of the other gospels and number three sing with fellow classmates because he lives as an act of communal worship let me say a word about uh, the lesson aim two here from the standard and that is compare and contrast accounts of those uh, of the other gospels with those of the other gospels i should say uh, unfortunately we're not going to have time to do that today but i would certainly encourage you to uh, read all the gospel accounts of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the synoptic gospels, you would uh, read a parallel passages in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, and Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 11. And you can also read the entire uh, chapter 19 of the gospel according to John give a little uh, introduction um, would like to say um, uh, what I, my aim is in teaching uh, whether it's Sunday school or any uh, opportunity I have to teach God's Word uh, there are three objectives uh, primarily number one is to, uh, to understand what God's Word says uh, that's uh, the clear understanding, uh, getting over uh, cultural 
uh, barriers and language barriers. We know the Bible was translated from uh, Hebrew, Chaldee, Aramaic, and Greek, and it's getting over those barriers, getting over the cultural uh, barriers, uh, things that were commonplace back in uh, biblical times uh, were understood uh, by those people and perhaps not in our culture. And then third, understanding that all of God's word is spiritually discerned. It is spiritually understood. So understanding what it says and then understanding what it means or what it meant when it was written to those people, the clear understanding that they had of what was said. And then thirdly, and most importantly for us, what does it mean to us today? What does it mean to us today? So uh, while we're going to be reviewing the historical narrative, and that is the witness of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those witnesses, the first were women. And we'll say a word about that uh, as we get into the lesson. Uh, but then ultimately, as we read uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, over 500 witnessed the resurrected Christ at one time, many of whom were still living at the time Paul wrote that epistle uh, and so we're going to understand the clear narrative of the witness of his resurrection of the Lord's resurrection but then we're going to spend uh, some time um, uh, discussing what it means to us what does the resurrection of Christ mean to us and the world so before we again share a bit of uh, introduction, we'll go to the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you, Lord, first of all, for your, your, your darling son, Jesus, Lord, and for the shedding of his precious blood, Lord, on the cross for our sins, Lord, that our sins might be removed as far as he is from the West. Lord, it is, it is unfathomable to understand how he could bear the sins of the world, past, present, and future, him being the innocent lamb of God, Lord. We just thank you that he, he sacrificed his, his, his spotless, sinless life for us who were wretches, Lord. And we thank you for the salvation that we have through that shed blood. Lord, please help us to understand um, your word as we, we, we understand this is a familiar passage, Lord, that we will be studying. But Lord, show us more clearly than ever, Lord, what you intend for us to understand as to what was said, what it meant and what it means to us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I hope you all read the uh, devotional reading, uh, and the, I'm sorry, the uh, background scripture rather, including uh, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 picks up where uh, the Jews have already had their mock trial of Jesus by night. Uh, they've uh, apprehended him in the garden of Gethsemane they've had their mock trials and they are taking him to Pontius Pilate uh, the morning uh, of his crucifixion and it goes through the the trials and how uh, Pontius Pilate found no fault in him and ultimately washed his hands and how the people were persuaded to ask for Barabbas instead of Jesus and to yell out uh, crucify him crucify him and they said his blood be on us and on our children after Pilate says he's innocent of this uh, of this blood uh, and so uh, I hope you read all that and actually it ends with the crucifixion of Jesus which was the most hideous uh, torturous form of execution known to man in fact the uh, the word excruciating comes from crucifixion which means out of the cross the most uh, painful uh, uh, experience we can imagine is excruciating uh, pain and it comes again from crucifixion now before uh, Jesus was actually buried uh, there was a rush to get him off the cross because the Sabbath was approaching the Sabbath in, uh, began at, at sundown or 6 p.m. on Friday uh, Jesus came off the cross at, at 3, uh, and they uh, uh, or they found him dead uh, already, uh, and they pierced his, his side, 
if you will, but after they removed him from the cross, we know that Joseph of Arimathea had uh, asked Pilate for his body, and it was given to him, and he and Nicodemus, and again, this you have to read all of the gospel accounts of uh, not only the resurrection, but the crucifixion of Jesus as well, his passion, if you will. Uh, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were told they, they brought spices and they wrapped his body hurriedly uh, before it was placed in Joseph's own tomb, new tomb that was carved out. No man had ever laid in there uh, and carved out in stone. Now, they had not finished uh, uh, preparing his body for the burial. So the women, uh, Mary Magdalene and other Marys and other that were there, uh, saw where his body was placed and they intended to come back after the Sabbath to finish the preparation of his body for burial. So, and that's where we pick up at chapter 28 and verse 1. And we're going to read the first uh, division, uh, the scripture uh, pertaining to the first division from the quarterly, which is entitled The Arrival. That's a uh, taken from Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 to 3 and then we'll back up and have brief verse by verse uh, commentary so from the King James Version it reads in the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher and behold there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. So the first day of the week, as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, that was Sunday, again, following uh, the, uh, the Sabbath actually extended from 6 p.m. on Friday to 6 p.m. Saturday and of course it became dark shortly after that on Saturday so they came as even before it was light on the uh, sap on the first day of the week which was Sunday and we know Mary Magdala uh, had been a follower of Jesus for some time uh, he cast devil demons out of her and we know that uh, the other Mary could have been uh, one of a few uh, she could have been the mother of James and Joseph is spoken about in Matthew 27 56 or and possibly the wife of Cleopas but we're not told here specifically uh, what Mary that was we have to go to the gospel of Mark uh, verse chapter 16 verse 1 or Luke 24 verse 10 so they come to uh, finish again the preparation for um, Jesus' burial, proper burial, and they've got spices and so forth. Uh, and then we, we see that an earthquake occurs. Uh, and uh, they, we understand that they actually felt and witnessed this earthquake. Uh, and this was not uncommon uh, uh, at the appearance of God's moving or God's working or God sending an angel to appear or himself appearing we know that uh, when Jesus gave up the ghosts on the cross there were violent earthquakes and it, it had been dark for several hours and we know that the broken and graves were open and and people came out of the bodies came out of the grave and so forth so supernatural occurrences in nature uh, were often a witness at the appearance of God or his angel a theophany or a Christophany or an angelophany so verse 2 says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. So this was an announcement, uh, uh, if you will, of his descending from heaven. Uh, he came down with a thunder, if you will, or with mighty earthquakes. And then part C of uh, verse 2 says, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. 
So you, you hear, you've probably heard a lot about this stone that was rolled uh, in front of the sepulchre, or in front of the uh, the grave. The the the, 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 the you know, it was a small cave, if you will, that was carved out in the stone where the body was laid, and the entrance was thought to be like four by five, uh, and uh, the they, they roll they rolled a great disc shaped stone in a groove over this opening and I've heard it might have weighed uh, one and a half to two tons and took many men to uh, move it out of place, uh, put a uh, wedge under it to hold it while the body was placed in the tomb and then rolled it back into place. So in another gospel, we read about the women being concerned about who's gonna roll the stone away for them. Uh, however, uh, when they get to the grave site, they not only experience this earthquake, but they see uh, the angel roll back the stone. And in some accounts, some uh, commentary says that it was just tossed away. I mean, it was not just rolled back in the groove, but it was some distance from the entrance. It was tossed away as if it was uh, a frisbee uh, by the angel. Now, why did the angel roll back the stone did he roll back the stone to let jesus out no there's nothing said about jesus coming out after the stone was rolled back it just said that he rolled back the stone and of course we know that the stone was rolled back to let the women and others see that he had risen that he was not there jesus body was somehow translated or trans uh, actually uh, pass through the stone in fact pass through the very grave clothes he was wrapped in a very good uh, uh, grave wrappings if you will burial wrappings and verse 3 says his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow this was um, a, a type of Shekinah or there was an effulgence about his appearance that was supernatural, obviously supernatural, and it is uh, likened unto the appearance of Jesus uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, he was in a brilliant light, and he had brilliant clothes on, and uh, he glowed, uh, and so he was obviously otherworldly. He was not of this world. He was supernatural. Let's move on to the second uh, division, which is entitled The Announcement. That's covered between verses 4 and 7. Again, we'll stick with the KJV. And it reads, And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you to, into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. So backing up to verse 4, again it says, And for fear of him, the keepers, those are the, the Roman guards that were assigned to guard the tomb. The Jews asked for a guard, thinking that uh, this they called him a deceiver. His disciples would come and steal him away because they remembered him saying he would rise on the third day. And they said, and uh, the, the, the latter deception would be greater than the first if that were to happen. So Pilate assigned a guard and told him to make it as safe as he could. And they had a quadrinian, which was 16 guards all together, four on watch, 12 uh, others beside. And they took shifts of uh, four guards at a time, uh, which stayed awake and standing before the tomb. Now they all became uh, comatose, if you will, uh, as dead men. They shook at the appearance of this uh, supernatural being. Now, these are Roman guards now, and they uh, should be prepared for, should have been prepared for anything. They should have been brave, but they became so frightened that they were basically, as I said, comatose, and the King James says they became as dead men. 
Now, uh, we know, as we'll see in a minute, the women ob obviously were fearful as well, but not to the point of being comatose. And obviously they were, they were comforted by the angel. So verse five reads, and the angel answered and said unto the women, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He knew, of course, why they were coming to the tomb and obviously knew that Jesus had been crucified. Verse six, he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. As he said, he is risen as he said. Now, we don't have time to go uh, to all the places uh, in the Gospels where the Lord said he would rise, but just a few. Uh, take a look in your, your uh, when you have time, uh, at Matthew 16, 21, uh, Matthew 17, 9, uh, where he said he would rise on the third day. In fact, let's take a quick look at that first verse, Matthew uh, 16 verse 21 and this is after Peter's confession in Matthew 16 16 where he says thou art the Christ the son of the living God uh, and Jesus said you know blessed art thou Simon Barjona for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you and so forth so we go we skip down to verse 21 and it reads from that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and to be raised the third day, the third day. And then we know verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, far be it from you, Lord, that this didn't happen to you. And Jesus, of course, rebuked him. He said, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So that was one of the times that Jesus told um, uh, his disciples that he would be crucified, he would be killed, and that he would raise, be raised on the third day. And then, of course, in the latter part of verse 6 is the angel invites the women to come and see where the Lord lay. And we have to go to another gospel to see that, the, the again, the grave clothes were laying on the slab, that the stone slab that Jesus had been placed on, perfectly in place. The napkin that was bound about his head and the other wrappings were in place and had not been disturbed as if one someone got up and uh, unloose themselves. Uh, he had his body had been translated, if you will, through the clothing and also through the the cave itself or the the sepulchre itself. Verse seven. Now here is the announcement and command, if you will. Um, well, we've seen the announcement. The, the announcement was that he was risen. He had risen from the dead. The command now is. In verse 7, it says, uh, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you unto Galilee. There shall ye see him. And lo, I have told you. Now, uh, the angel instructs them, gives them clear instructions to go quickly and tell his disciples Disciples in this case could mean all of his followers, but more than likely it meant the 11. It meant those who would become apostles, those who were closest to him. Uh, elsewhere, uh, we'll see in a few minutes, Jesus refers to them as his brethren, but we're still talking about the 11. And he says that Jesus, he announces that Jesus is going before them to Galilee where they will see him. Now we know much of Jesus' ministry uh, was around uh, Galilee. Uh, in fact, uh, that is uh, his home uh, town area was in Galilee, Nazareth, which was part of Galilee. Also, so he ministered between there and of course Jerusalem, 
but he instructs them they're now in Jerusalem to go to Galilee and he's going to meet them there. Now he's told them this. He's already told them uh, that when he uh, rose, he would meet them in Galilee. And the angel concludes by saying, uh, Lo, I have told you, or now I have told you, to put an exclamation point behind his instruction or his command that they go as Jesus had commanded them uh, to meet them in uh, Galilee. So let's move into the third division, uh, which is entitled The Action, The Action, and that's covered between Matthew 28, verses 8 to 10. And it reads, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go, tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. So the women have been charged or commanded to go and bear witness of the empty tomb and what the angel had told them, and that is that Jesus had been resurrected. Understanding the culture of that day, uh, you would understand that women uh, were not considered reliable witnesses of anything. In fact, their testimony was uh, rarely uh, accepted in courts of law. Uh, and for, for, for because it was part of the culture, but also there were uh, thinking, thinkings that women be, could become hysterical because of their uh, menstruation and uh, the, the witness was just not reliable at those times and other times. So uh, anyway, um, and they are leaving hastily. They're running with jo mixed feelings here. Uh, joy at the news that he is resurrected. Uh, of course, there's still some lingering uh, fear of uh, uh, what they saw, the angel's uh, awesome presence, even though the angel had told them to fear not. Uh, and so they, they've got these mixed emotions and they're excited and they're running to give this news, great news to his disciples. Again, the 11. And as they went... Uh, verse 9 says, to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, all hail. And actually, the NIV says, uh, greetings, but there's a little more to that greeting than just greetings. Uh, all hail is a Greek greeting that can also be translated rejoice. You can see that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Uh, and uh, it so it, it was more than just a casual greeting the Lord was actually telling them to rejoice uh, at his resurrection as he greeted them and then he goes on to say and they came or the, the, the verse goes on to say and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him so they came and fell down at his feet uh, and they worshiped him. And we know from another gospel, uh, they cling to him. They, they clung to his feet. And the Lord said, don't cling to me. Now, I know it's translated. He said, touch me not, or I have not yet ascended to my father. But in this case, he's saying, don't cling to me. He said, uh, uh, what, what was really meant by the other parallel passage is that uh, don't cling to me because I'm not here to stay I'm, I'm, I've got to ascend to my father and your father now he uh, uh, they the interesting thing is that they worship him and he does not prevent them from doing that we know elsewhere in the Bible uh, men attempted to worship uh, Paul and Barnabas men uh, we know that John in Revelation attempted to worship the angel that was guiding him and they were forbid forbidden to do that because they were not God and only God is deserving of our worship so the fact that Jesus did not prevent them from worshiping him certainly uh, was uh, a testimony of his 
the divine nature of him being God. And then finally, verse 10 says, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go, tell my brethren that they go to they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now, he basically uh, uh, calms them because, uh, you know, seeing someone that you saw crucified brutally and placed in the grave and then you're alive again can be uh, a frightening experience. I mean, it, it, it certainly would be the most. And so he calms them, and then he gives them the same instruction that the angel had given him and he says to go and tell my brothers meaning again the 11 not all of the disciples he had hundreds and perhaps thousands of followers but he is referring to the 11 that would become apostles his brothers and go tell them to go to galilee uh which is where uh he had an, he had told them that he would meet them uh, on his re after his resurrection, mm -hmm. and we know that this Galilee uh, was also called Galilee of the Gentiles, and perhaps because there was a large population of uh, Gentiles as well as Jews in that region, and this is where uh, his ministry would continue through his disciples, uh, who would become apostles. Uh, the ministry to the entire world of the gospel, spreading the gospel. And that brings us to um, uh, what does it mean? Now we've, we've gone through uh, verse by verse. Uh, we've tried to understand what it says, uh, what it meant to uh, those uh, it was written to uh, uh, originally. We want to understand what does the resurrection of Christ mean to us. And to understand that, uh, there's several places we could go. Uh, the place I think uh, states it most succinctly is the first, uh, is first Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, and we're going to take a little time with this because, uh, again, it's the most important thing for us. Now, understanding certainly... Uh, what God, God's word says and what it meant to those it was uh, written to originally or it, it was written for all of us please don't misunderstand me but what it meant in the day it was written uh, was perhaps one thing and what it means to us today uh, we want to understand that as best we can now when the Bible tells us to rightly divide the word of truth it means to understand uh, certainly uh, who, 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 what's being said to whom and for what reason? Okay, many promises in the Bible are to the Jews, um, to the Hebrews, and there's many, many to the church. Uh, and we know that we are to, to rightly divide. We're not looking for any promised land now. Our promised land is in heaven. So those promises uh, given to the Jews about restoring them to the land and so forth and rescuing them and so they could. Uh, be fruitful in the land don't pertain to us we're unless we use them as examples as the word says all of scripture was written for our example now, those things were in particular so let's look at first uh, corinthians chapter 15 now we know paul in the first few verses he actually defines the gospel okay what is the gospel which means good news good news of what okay he says uh, moreover brethren I declare to you, beginning of verse 1, the gospel, I explain again the gospel, which I preached to you, which also ye received, in which and in which ye stand, by which also ye are saved, you're delivered. Delivered from what? From the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately from the very presence of sin. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless ye be believed in vain for no good reason, for no reason at all. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. This is part of the good news. He died for our sins according to the scripture as it was foretold, and that he was buried 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, okay, as it was foretold, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once to whom the greater part remains today and that goes on to talk about further witnesses of the resurrected Christ okay so the good news very succinctly is that Christ died for our sins and that he was raised and raised bodily he was not a spirit he was raised bodily what does that mean what does it mean for us we have to skip down to verse 12 so we pick up at verse 12, and I'm going to read through 19, and then I'm going to kind of summarize uh, some points. So it says, beginning at verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and you and your faith is also empty, or vain, or useless. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. Verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen and if Christ is not risen your faith is futile you are still in your sins then also those who have fallen asleep or died in Christ have perished they are lost eternally that's my comment and then finally verse 19 if in this life only we have hope in Christ we are of all men most pitiable most pitiable now in that passage between verses 12 and 19 Paul actually gives six disastrous consequences of Christ not rising from the dead now unfortunately we don't have we don't have the time to do a real deep dive uh, on these consequences like I'd like to. So I'm going to read them. I'm going to give you a few verses to follow up on in your own study. And I pray that you will. So number one, he says, the preaching of, if Christ is not risen, the preaching of Christ would be senseless. Okay, it would be meaningless. All right, now, um, we have to understand that the resurrection of Christ and of believers stand or fall together, okay, because of the very word of God in his Bible. Uh, we don't have time to go there, but take a look at uh, Revelations chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Revelations chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Number two, so so the, the point is, if Christ was not raised as the first fruits, and we'll we'll talk about that hopefully in a, in a few minutes, then there's no reason to think that we will be raised. If He had not the power to raise Himself from the dead, uh, why should we think uh, He would have power to raise us? In fact, everything that He said about His resurrection was a lie. Okay. And, uh, of course, uh, if, we, if we can't believe that, what, what, what else could we believe of what Christ said about himself and about the, uh, our eternal uh, life or the salvation that he offered through his sacrifice? Number two, faith in Christ would be useless. Okay, faith is... Uh, he just, I mean, Hebrews tells us the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, we have faith in what we cannot see, and our faith is based on the word of God. Uh, Christ was not risen after saying he would be raised. He said he had power, again, to lay his own life down 
and power to take it up again, then if he was not able to take his life up, what is there to have faith in? It, what is there to have a confident expectation of or hope for beyond the grave if Christ could not raise himself and is in fact still dead? Please take a look. Well, let, let me hold off on that. Number three, um, all witness and witnesses and preachers of the resurrection would be liars. Uh, the Christianity is based, I mean, the essential uh, message of, of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, and his resurrection for our justification. We'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And most believe, most uh, preachers, of the gospel have a central message and that is the resurre of the resurrection of Christ. And if he was not raised, then they're all liars, all witnesses and preachers of the gospel, which again, I define as the death and resurrection of the Lord, the death of Jesus Christ for our sins and his bodily resurrection. Paul defined that again in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Number four, reason number four, no one would be redeemed from sin. You are still in your sins. If what Christ promised us of our sins, uh, being given a right standing before God through justification, uh, then we are not forgiven of our sins. We're still condemned to hell our eternal death, the Lord said, the soul that sinneth shall die. We are still in our sins. If there is no salvation in Christ based on his resurrection, his bodily resurrection, uh, please see uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, and then Romans chapter 4, verse 25. I'm going to read Romans chapter 4, verse 25, and it reads... Let me let me back up um, to uh, 23. Uh, it says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verse 25. Who was delivered up because of our offenses or our sins. He was delivered up to what? To the cross, to death, and was raised because of our justification. He was raised because of our justification. And we know that his sacrifice was a, uh, 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 a replacement, if you will, for our sins as a remedy or the, uh, the satisfaction uh, for justice that God sought for our sins and we could also go back to Romans 3 26 and, and by that by his sacrifice he be, and his resurrection his raising he became the just and the justifier of the ungodly of those who were sinners and uh, an ungodly before God and actually uh, Romans 3.26 says to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, this is the righteousness of God, that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. Okay, that the faith in Jesus is uh, justifies us, is what enables him to impute his righteousness to us and give us a standing before God, which is what justification means, a right standing before God. Number five, all former believers who uh, would have perished. In other words, all those who died uh, having faith in Christ, having faith in the eternal life that was ahead, uh, have perished. They are eternally lost. And I. Uh, that is a consequence of uh, the, that would be a consequence of the fact that uh, if Christ had not 
uh, been resurrected. And then finally, uh, number six, Christians would be the most pitiable people on earth because we would have believed a lie concerning our eternal life. Uh, we would have uh, lived our lives in the hope of uh, being in the presence of the Lord in joy and peace forevermore. If Christ had not the power to raise his own life, how could he have the power to raise ours? And if all that he said about uh, his loss and to forgive, uh, to make it, uh, make a way for us to be given a, a righteous standing before God because of his righteousness and to have eternal life beyond this life about him going to prepare a place for us and coming back to receive us to him. So all that he said would have been a lie if Christ had not risen. I, I know I've gone a bit long here, and, I, and uh, but I, I, I wanted to, to put a little more emphasis uh, in this lesson on what the resurrection means to us. So as we enjoy our and rejoice in our salvation, uh, this resurrection day or this Easter, uh, let's remember uh, what it really means to us. It means that we can look forward to joy and peace forevermore when we are resurrection. Christ was the first fruits. We will be resurrected bodily as he was resurrected. Okay, we know that to be absent from the body spiritually is to be present with the Lord. So our spirit will go to be with the Lord at the moment it departs from this body. Bodies to be resurrected at the last day. So I pray that uh, we've learned a little more in this lesson than perhaps we knew before. And we just again pray that you have a, a blessed uh, resurrection day and a blessed week. Lord God, we do thank you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And again, we pray that we've understood it as you intended for us to understand it. We pray that our faith uh, in you would be increased always, that our obedience to your word would be increased. And Lord, help us to share this good news, this gospels to others this week and beyond. Again, we thank and we praise you for your darling son, Lord, for his sacrifice on the cross and for his glorious resurrection, Lord, with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.